Um, so today I want to talk to you about Siftables, which is an early example of what I call an embodied media user interface. And the point of Siftables is to change the way that we play and work with digital information by making information items physical so we can manipulate them by hand. Each Siftable is a self-contained, gesture-sensitive computer about the size of a cookie. And you interact with a group of Siftables by scooting them around on a tabletop together, moving and arranging them with your hands. But why would you want to play with a computer as a bunch of little cookie-sized tiles? Well, the way we access and manipulate information matters a lot. Here's a historical example. I don't know how many of you remember the bad old days of computing, but to make a program in these days, you would punch holes in a bunch of cardboard pieces, stack them up, and feed them into the machine. And the thing was, in these days, computer programmers had to be really careful. You had to check and double check and triple check that program before you would dare feed it into the machine. And the reason was, it was an incredibly long feedback loop if you realized you had a bug. If there was a problem in your program, you might have to wait till the end of the day, or to the end of the week before you could fix it and feed it back in because computation was a scarce resource. There weren't, as, there weren't enough computers and it took a long time. Um, so in the meantime, we've moved in this direction of rapid prototyping in the way we write computer programs. And now we have access to so much computation, computers are so fast, that it's often a better idea if you have a thought about some computer program you want to write to just try it. Just give it a try before spending too much time deliberating about whether it's a good idea or not. And the result is that we can imagine all kinds of new and wonderful things to do with computers and make them pretty easily, rather than having to be cautious as people did in the past. So the takeaway is that it's often a better idea just to try something rather than deliberating about it for too long. And the interface that can allow us to try things quickly is a good one. So there's a field of study that started in the 1980s with the work of Ed Hutchins, and it's called Distributed Cognition. And the basic idea is the objects, the tools that we use when we're problem solving, make a big difference in how we effectively we can solve problems. So here's an example you might recognize. Tetris. There was a study done on Tetris players where the researchers were looking at how many rotations people would apply to a Tetris piece on average before dropping that piece into the bottom. And what they found, which was counterintuitive to me when I first heard it, was that the greater the skill level of the player, the more rotations on average the player would apply to the piece before dropping it. Think about that for a minute. If you're a better Tetris player, you're going to rotate the piece more times, usually, than a less skilled player. And it was counterintuitive to me because I thought, well, if you're a good player, you should just see where that piece needs to go and put it there, right? Why should you over-rotate the piece? But what it turns out these players were doing was they were using that visual representation of the piece and the landscape at the bottom to help them think about the problem. It was easier and faster to just rotate the piece and then look at it to see how it would line up with the bottom than it was to do the whole thing in your head. Another example, uh, also having to do with games, um, Scrabble tiles. They took two groups of people and gave them the same set of Scrabble tiles. And the task was to find as many words as you can in a given amount of time. And the difference was one group was allowed to rearrange the tiles with their hands while the other group had to just look at the tiles and call out the words that they could see that were possible. And in this case, maybe it's not so surprising, but the group that was allowed to reach out and move the tiles around did better. They found more words, and they found words faster. So the takeaway is that the interface to our problem solving makes a big difference. And the bigger picture is really the common knowledge that having the right tool for the job makes a big difference. It really does. So there's a deep connection between play and the efficient manipulation of problems. When we work on a toy problem, for instance, as a student, as these Stanford students are doing in their mechanical engineering class, we enter a low-risk setting that allows us to try new ideas and explore alternatives, to make some mistakes and recover, to enjoy successes, and to reflect on what we learned. And so there's a connection between this classroom setting 
and the scenario I mentioned, how we do better with Tetris shapes or Scrabble tiles when we can manipulate the problem easily. And the connection is both examples demonstrate the power of rapid prototyping for problem solving. We can play with the problem outside of our heads using the tools and easily try things out to see what happens. Mistakes are not costly and we can have uninhibited exploration that leads to discovery. So I'm definitely not the first person to recognize this connection between play and learning. This is a quote that I like by Diane Ackerman that sums it up. Play is our brain's favorite way of learning. And so the fact that we don't have to use punch cards anymore means that we can play with computers. And the result of that play is the diversity of uses we've designed for them. So let's talk about play in the context of games. Games are a form of recreational problem solving. Jane McGonigal mentioned that in her talk. People have been getting together to play games based around physical objects for thousands of years. These are the original social games before we had Farmville or anything else on Facebook or even the internet. So classic games like checkers, chess, mahjong, go, these games take advantage of the way we can easily handle and grasp physical things like chess pieces or scrabble tiles. But fast forward now to video games. Think about that. If we were playing video games together, we would either all be looking up at one big screen or we'd each be buried in our own little personal display. Playing video games, we lose that face-to-face -face social context of classic games and we lose that act of rearranging physical objects to manipulate the problem space of the game. So my collaborators and I, we had an insight after we built the first version of Siftables, which I'm about to show you more of, but at that point, we were playing with different applications to learn what Siftables were good for. And we asked the following question. What if we could merge the object-based play that we have from classic games with the interactive nature of video games? So Siftables is a hybrid that combines these two forms of play, physical objects with interactive behavior. Jeevan Kalanithi and I built the first prototype of Siftables as graduate students at the MIT Media Lab. And we formed a company last summer to bring this idea to the world. So what is a siftable? Each siftable is a smart tile with color graphics on top, neighbor detection on all four sides, motion sensing, and wireless communication. Siftables work together to implement games and other playful interactive applications. So this is a math equation editor that is very simple. It just shows an answer to the equation when you make a sequence. could be more of a game where you have to find the right answer. But in this case, we wanted to just make a very simple interaction. And, and I tilted that tile to turn the plus into a minus. That was the gesture there. We didn't implement uh, multiplication or division yet. Uh, my colleague, Seth Hunter, uh, designed some educational applications for Siftables. And this is a sentence-making application. So when the three siftables showing words are placed in order, the fourth siftable shows a picture of the sentence that you made. Feet on street. So there's feet on a street. Street on feet. There's a street on feet. And then he shakes it to advance to the next set of bun words. And sun. Hamburger bun in the sun. Sun and bun. Sun and bun. So you can imagine the possibilities for education, A, B, C, one, two, three, putting elements together to form molecules, matching animals to their habitats. The list goes on, but this basic style of interaction with objects is what we're after here. This next one is a sketch of a maze game built by Tobe Nuana, who is an undergraduate working with me at MIT. And the way it works is you explore a large territory by moving the tiles around. That's your character, the circular dot. And you move your character from one area to another by tilting. It's borrowing this gesture of dumping an object from one container to another. And so you can explore around this maze as if you had a flashlight. You could shine one grid cell in, in, in the other dire in a direction. And then if you shake one of the tiles, you'll see a map that shows you where you are now and where you've been. And then shake it again, you can go back to play mode. So this game, uh, this idea of adopting a gesture from our real lives is something we liked. Dumping a character the way we dump an object from one container to another. And we realized that with this new interface, we had an opportunity to define a new interaction language with Siftables, a language for multi-object gesture. And if the, so if the tiles are the nouns, 
What are the verbs? Here are a few of the many that we've uh, thought of. So pouring. Imagine uh, you've got a video game character on one tile, and you pour health into that character with the other one, just like pouring a liquid, but putting it next to it and tilting to boost the character's energy. Queuing, lining things up is something we do all the time with physical objects. We could line the tiles up to spell out an equation, to put individual video clips from a home movie together into an edit, or to make uh, a passageway for my game character to explore. These tiles can also sense motion in their environment, so thumping on a table surface can be a way to send them all a signal at the same time. So it could be used to clear the settings or to reset a game level, kind of like shaking an Etch-a-Sketch upside down. So a new interactive system like Siftables is really only as powerful and as useful as the applications it can implement. So we know that a lot of other people around the world are going to have a lot of good ideas for using them that we never thought of. They're already emailing us. So what we're doing is creating a software simulator and a programming environment that we can share to enable people to program their own ideas for the system. So this, what you're seeing on the lower right is our simulator. It's totally in software. It's on the screen of a computer. But it's implementing the same behavior as the video on the top left which is just showing that they recognize each other when they get next to each other. So the, uh, the irony of, uh, of building an on-screen simulation of a physical user interface was not lost on us. But it's, it's useful for us to develop new ideas before we have the next generation of the tiles ready to go. So in the couple of minutes that I have left, uh, I want to show you some examples of the types of playful applications that we're now working on. So these are all applications running in the simulator, in the computer, but they're the kind of things that we can move them to the tiles once we're ready to try them out with people. This first one is a maze exploration game where you move the tiles around to explore a larger territory, like a larger dungeon. It's kind of like classic Legend of Zelda. This one is a, another idea of a math game where you're showing that you know which fraction is bigger than which other fraction by putting them in the right order. This is kind of like Tetris or Rubik's Cube. Basically, you tilt the tiles to shift the contents around and then put them next to each other and colors that match will clear. That one's really fun. This is a simple sequencing game where you line up the fish in increasing order. And then this one is a memory game where the idea is you flip the tiles over and then flip them back and then something may have changed while they were upside down. And your job is to press on the ones that have changed, if you can recognize that. So see if you can get it. OK, those two changed. Right. So I want to finish up with the big vision for Siftables and what they represent. Siftables shifts us from a way of interacting with digital content, uh, with digital content items where we point to icons and move them around on a screen to a different style where the information items are physical and we can grasp and move them directly with our hands. So we think this is great for games and it will be great for a lot of other things too. So, and with our daily lives becoming so much about managing information, we need to be able to manipulate that information as easily as possible. So for instance, I have a colleague who's a scientist. She studies epidemiology and she wants to hook susceptibles up to the variables in her computational model of malaria propagation so she can try out different scenarios quickly in order to more fully explore different approaches to eradication. Educators have also reached out to us. They want to use Siftables as a teaching tool to enable kids to explore topics ranging from gene expre expression to complexity theory. So to sum it up, we're at a special moment in history right now where we can now build our dream tools for interacting with information in physical, playful ways. And we can truly build the next generation of hand tools and play objects for the digital age. There's a lot more work to be done, and I hope you'll stay tuned. Thank you for your attention. <laughs>